Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 133, Teens and Their Digital Footprint. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my responsible and mature co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing fantastic. So this is our first episode, getting back into things after the holiday. Uh, how was your holiday? Um... I'd say it went pretty good. Oh, good. Did you get all the stuff that you wanted? You know, all the stuff that you asked for in the last podcast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing we had that podcast because most of that stuff was bought right after the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so today we're talking about teens and their digital footprint. So what is a digital footprint? How is it created? What impact can it have on our lives? How can we control it? Well, we'll answer all these questions and give you some hints on what you can and can't do to protect your digital footprint on this episode of Insights into Teens. Before we do that, though, I do want to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of the podcast can be found listed as Insights into Things. And we're available pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast, Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, uh, Buzzsprout, etc. I would also invite our audience to write in, give us your feedback, give us your show suggestions on what you'd like us to talk about. Let us know if you have any questions for us. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're at Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Little, uh, little mishap here with our digital device, but that's okay. <laughs> Didn't have to mention it. Uh, or you can get links to all that stuff on our official website at insights into things.com. <coughs> Are we ready to get started? Yeah. All right, here we go. You're not going to drop anything else, right? No. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what is a digital footprint? So this definition, depending on, depending on who you ask, you get a different answer, but they're pretty much all consistent. This particular definition comes from webwatcher.com. Essentially, it's a record of everything that you do or will do online. It's the record of the website you log into, the online games you play, the pictures you share on social media, the comments you make under news articles and on websites, the online classified ads you post, or anything else you do online. There's really two big wrong assumptions that teens and others, even adults, make about their online activity. They assume that anything that they do can be private, or they assume that anything is ever really gone. One good example of this is something like a teen uploading a photo, deciding a minute or so later that they don't look good in the photo, and then immediately deleting it, which can seem minor to them. Probably no one, or not that many people saw it, and now it's gone, right? Well, not necessarily. The photo could still be on the servers of the site the teen uploaded it to. And if anyone saw it and screenshotted it, They could do anything with that photo, share it, save it, or even edit it. Nothing is ever fully private online, and nothing that's put online is ever fully gone. Keep that in mind as you learn more about your digital footprint 
and make sure that your teen understands it as well. It's a moment to stop here a second and to kind of talk about what we do. So if you post a picture on Instagram or Facebook or even on Twitter, people have this impression that, oh, that photo's on my phone, I'm posting it, so if I delete it, I have control over it. The instant that you post that, whether it's a photo or a meme or even a text post itself, that leaves your device, goes over the mystical internet waves and lands on some server somewhere. And a lot of times, in, in most cases, the way the networks work, it lands on many servers. And if you delete that, you don't have the ability to delete it from all the servers. You can usually hide it from your profile, but that stuff always shows up out there. And even, even then, you have services like the Wayback Machine, which is an internet archive, that periodically goes through and captures it's what's called spider. It'll spider websites, capture static images of those, and then store that on its own site. So there are things from the 1990s you can go back and look at on their site that's not available anywhere else on the internet anymore because some of the servers might not even be online. So it's very important to be careful about the type of stuff that you put out there. Do you put anything, I mean, aside from the podcast, obviously, we, we put out there for everyone. Do you post on social media? Do you put images out there? Do you do anything like that where you're you're producing for your digital footprint? Other than the podcast, no. I don't use really any social media. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook. Definitely not on Twitter. I'm really not on any social media sites, and I never really like... Like, other than maybe the texting app, like the messages on iPhone and, you know, just... Well, and that's that. a good example, too, because even the texting app, that text is not on your phone and the person you're sending it to. When you text to someone, like you use an iPhone, for instance, so if you message someone on your, your, your messaging app on iPhone, that goes out and sits on Apple's, web, uh, Apple's server at that point in time. So even if you delete it, they potentially have a copy of it. So, again, anything that goes out there is potentially something that's going to be preserved for, I would say, eternity, but the Internet hasn't been around that long to, to make bold gestures like that. Mm. So, it's important to understand what our digital footprint is and the impact that it has. Why don't you tell us more about how we can understand our digital footprint? So whether or not you're aware, you contribute to your digital footprint or profile each day when you log onto the internet. The websites you visit, the news posts you comment on, the comments you leave on, a so on social media platforms, each of these items come together to create a portrait of your online life. The digital footprint that is left behind can have repercussions in all areas of your teen's life, potentially resulting in missed job opportunities, public sharing of personal information, ruined relationships, or, in what is likely more relevant to them right now, their parents finding out what they've been up to and subsequently being punished. Dun, dun, dun. Really? You gotta add the sound? <laughs> well, I didn't have the sound queued up, so I had to do it myself. Mm. Your child's digital footprint is the way they behave online. Their digital citizenship are important because teens have uh, grown up with technology all around them and are not yet equipped with the knowledge that their actions go far beyond the blog comment or Facebook post they just left. A poor decision made in a split second can damage your child's digital footprint and follow them through adulthood, which is why teaching your child about good digital citizenship and social media etiquette is of the utmost importance. Take, for example, the teens who had their admission offers rescinded because of their Facebook, because of their behavior in a Facebook group for newly admitted students. Those students likely spent their entire academic careers preparing for admission to an Ivy League school, only to have their online behavior ruin what they had worked towards. The Harvard Crimson, the daily student newspaper of Harvard University, reported. In the group, students sent each other memes and other images mocking sexual assault, the Holocaust, and the deaths of children 
according to screenshots of the chat obtained by the Crimson. Some of these messages joked that abusing children was sexually arousing, while others had punchlines directed at specific ethnic or racial groups. After being notified of the chat and its contents, Harvard administrators acted by rescinding offers for at least 10 members of the group. While the students in question did not a- intend for their highly inappropriate posts to be seen worldwide, the moral of the story is, nothing is truly private on the internet. And while this seems like an obvious statement to make, the truth is that kids of all ages are still making social media mistakes that could affect their future. Make sure your teen is aware of what their digital footprint looks like and what it means for them now and further down the line. There was a time when it was difficult to find out information like this about people, um, like for jobs. Okay, so when you went to apply for a job, if it was a high-paying job or or a high-level job, you'd t- typically go through a series of interviews. They'd vet your background that you give on your resume or your your CV, and they'd call previous employers and they try to build a profile of the type of person that you are. Some companies would even go so far as to hire a private investigator to do background checks on you. Um, If you worked, you're applying for a government job or a contractor for a government agency, they might even have the government do a security background check on you where they check your credit and debt and all that stuff. But it was difficult to do. So with with the advent of the internet, We put so much information out there voluntarily, which it's frightening how much information people are willing to put on the internet, personal things that they talk about, personal information that they talk about, things that you would never go up to a stranger on the street and and tell them these things or give them this information. People feel at ease on social media, especially or their personal websites, or their personal blogs. People used to put so much stuff in their personal blogs that it made it so easy for people to go out there and figure out what kind of person you are. To the point that even now, you have situations where very high-profile people are being called on the carpet for stuff they did 10 years ago. Were you aware of the... um, the, the Jeopardy hosting scandal that happened last year? No. So Alex Trebek was ill with cancer, and he had to sort of step back from his hosting duties. So they went through this whole process of trying to find a new host, and they had different celebrities come in and guest host and stuff like that. Well, ultimately, they made the decision of having an existing executive producer host. So he comes in, hosts for a very short period of time, And then controversial remarks that he had posted on the internet almost 10 years ago come to light. Well, he's immediately disgraced as a result of that and loses the job. And it's stuff like, had you not said those things in the first place, you wouldn't have gotten into the situation that you're in. But 10 years ago when you said those things, you were probably a very different person. But that stuff sticks around. So when you have, I don't want to say it's incriminating information because it wasn't anything criminal or anything, but when you willingly put information out there and then people find it when you're trying to get a job or go to college or something like that, you're basically giving them the ammunition they need to deny you what you want in life. So it's very important to be aware of what you're putting out there, you know, anonymize what you, one of the terms that they tend to use in, 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 in digital security is something called fuzzing and fuzzing is when you confuse the data that you put out there. You anonymize it to a certain extent. Maybe you post it under an alias, or maybe you post conflicting information so that you can say, okay, well, I may have argued Let's take uh, abortion, for instance. So I may have argued in one post in favor of abortion, and then I argued in another post in opposition. Well, what's my position? 
Well, I'm really just trying to look at it from two points of view. You can't really tell what my position is at that point in time. That's fuzzing your data. If I post it as, you know, Joe Whalen, my name, then it's tied directly back to me. If I post it as disgruntled guy in New Jersey, well, then you can't tie it directly back to me. That's another way of fuzzing your, your, your data. So how you present yourself, what you present out there, um, and how, how much detail you put out there is, is stuff that you need to keep in mind. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about five potential harmful digital footprint impacts, one of which we've talked about already, but we'll go through all five. We'll be right back. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about teens and their digital footprint. And now we're going to be talking about five potentially potentially harmful digital footprint impacts for teens. And this comes to us from Family Online Safety Institute. So in our previous segment, we discussed one very real-world scenario in which digital footprints had direct consequences. Here are the top five things that could be harmed by an inappropriate digital footprint. The first we pretty much already talked about, which is college admissions, but we also added on the military. As mentioned above, college admission admissions officers can and do read your teen's profi- online profile. If your son or daughter is applying to a college and is on the bubble against another applicant, The difference between them gaining acceptance and receiving a rejection letter could be something immature that was posted on social media. This extends to moral aptitude requirements in the military if your child is planning on enlisting. Scholarships often are another target that fall prey to this. Scholarships often ask applicants to share their social media profiles as part of the process in applying online. Any immature posts, cyberbullying, or generally distasteful material found on your child's profile could prevent them from gaining a scholarship. This kind of goes hand in hand with sports, our third one. Is your son or daughter planning on playing sports in college? Recruiters and coaches surely will want to know about your teen's conduct on social media. The fourth we have is employers and internships. Employers will Google your kids. Even if it's just a job they are applying for to make some extra money while going to college. Additionally, college in- college internships are now becoming a prerequisite for gaining employment post college. Internships are competitive enough. The difference between your son or daughter and another applicant could be their digital footprint. And the final one we have is identity theft. Your teen's identity is at risk. Any photo that is publicly shared is fair game for identity thieves. Posting personal information is a serious liability. Identity theft is on the rise and is a serious problem with very damaging consequences. So let's take a look at a couple of these and and dive a little bit deeper. So I, I think we kind of exhausted the potential for college admissions. Military sort of in the same thing. The military has a very strict code of conduct. So if you're seen as, as violating that code of conduct even before you enter the military, it could hurt your chances. It could impact um, how you're treated or, or what your potential 
uh, future and position is in the military as well. Mm. But scholarships, like most people don't think that scholarships would be affected by your social media presence. But you'd be surprised how many things affect your scholarships. And we actually have a uh, a podcast that we're researching that we're going to actually do on scholarships and what's involved later on down the line here. But it's important to note that when you apply for a scholarship, that's it's not free money. It's not a gift. It's not somebody thinks you're a good guy. It's institutes that back the scholarships are, are really trying to find someone who epitomizes their standards or someone that can represent that institution that's backing the scholarship or someone that they think will go on to do things in line with what that institution stands for. And the, one of the biggest things is beyond academics or athletics, which probably are the two biggest qualifiers for scholarships, is character. You know, if you have a, a representation of a poor character, think of a scholarship as a sponsorship. Someone sponsoring you to, to further your education. It could be because they think that you're going to be a great athlete or a great scientist. Or, you know, you could potentially be a leader in the business world someday. But it's a, it's a sponsorship. And, and sponsors want people representing who they think represents them. So when they go out there and they look at your social media and they see inappropriate posts or just simply immature posts, it very quickly can turn them off. Any thoughts on that? Um, I can totally understand why people wouldn't be giving given scholarships due to how they act. I definitely think you explained it pretty well. And your sports tend to go along the same path there because when you're getting when you're trying to get into a sports program in a college, a lot of colleges are represented by their athletes. They're the, the people, you know, that on, on Saturday afternoons when you're watching college football and you see, you know, your Notre Dame out there, those kids on that field are the college. And if they bring someone into their fold that doesn't represent that college, then it looks bad for the college. It's not just, oh, well, he, they're, they're not going to get along with people. It's. We want people that are going to represent us and, and present the college in a very positive light. And if you don't do that, just the same thing with a scholarship. If, if you don't do that, they need to find that out before they bring you in. Because, you know, the old adage that one bad apple can ruin the batch. You know, they get a, a, a player out there who's vulgar or outwardly uh, aggressive or something like that, people see that on national television and immediately think that, you know, this college isn't for us. And then they, their, their enrollees, the number of people going to that college starts to drop off because of the image that's, that's being employed. Mm. I think probably the most significant one is employers. Yeah. Today, a lot of employers will Google you. Have you ever Googled yourself to see what you look like online? I actually just did it today. And what did you find? Anything surprising? Honestly, I just saw a bunch of other people who had the same name as me, and the only real images that actually had anything to do with me was one image of the Insights in the Teens logo and the one cartoon image from the website. Right. Yeah. So, and that's like if I do a search on me, that's pretty much what I find too. But, which is good. That means that, you know, our marketing program for the website is actually effective. <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing that most employers do now, my employer does this. They'll Google you. They'll look at your Facebook page. They'll see what you do online, what you post online. Now, they don't look at political beliefs or religious beliefs or anything like that. They look for any inappropriateness. You know, you can very quickly look at someone's digital footprint nowadays and kind of sum up their personality. And once you understand someone's personality, you can tell if they're a good fit for the company. 
Now, that's not to say that they don't have the technical expertise to do the job, but that's only one aspect of hiring someone. They have to be a good fit because if you hire someone who's really good at their job but can't get along with anyone and they have to work in a team, then they become a disruptive presence. Mm -hmm. And you can generally find that out from, from someone's social media profile there real, real quickly. Okay. The last one here is identity theft. Now, we haven't really talked about that on the podcast before, and we, we probably should do a, a podcast on it. Do you know what identity theft is? Um, I know it's basically where people basically take your identity, like use images of you, use basically they pretend to be you. Right. So a lot of times what happens is there's different forms of it. W one area that a lot of people focus on is financial identity theft, where someone can impersonate you. They can gain access to your bank accounts, your credit cards, stuff like that. They can open credit cards in your name if they get certain information. And then they go off and they charge all this up and you get the bill for it. So that's probably the biggest form of identity theft. But another form is impersonation, online impersonation. And I think most people kind of overlook that. Because we talked, everything we've talked about here is about your image, your personality, who you are. Well, if you have someone that's very mad at you for something, maybe you have uh, an ex you broke up with and they want to get back at you for revenge. Maybe you made somebody mad at school or something like that. They can actually go out there and generate it and find enough generated information about you that they can gain access to your social media. Or like you aren't on Twitter, you said. The safest thing really is to go and open accounts on all the social media platforms and claim your name so that nobody else can claim that digital space of yours and make it yours. Because if you're not on Facebook, for instance, and somebody wants to make you look bad, they'll go out and find an image of you and, and grab that image. They'll go create a profile and they'll start acting inappropriately on social media under an account that you never had anything to do with, but because they're impersonating you, when you go for that college admissions board, they search you, they find this fake profile, you look bad and it impacts you. So a lot of people don't think that they have to protect their image online. They, when they think identity theft, they just think, oh, well, I don't want someone stealing my credit card or bank information. But your presence on the internet is valuable. Have you ever considered anything along those lines? No, not really. It's, it's very important because the other thing you have to think of is when you go to a site like Google, okay, and you use Google services, they don't charge you for it because the service itself isn't where they make their money. Where they make their money is you. You're their product. You're, you might hear, have you ever heard the word metadata? Maybe. So metadata is the information they gather when you use their services. Okay. When you log on, where you log on from, geographically where you are, what ads you look at, what things you click on, what you get in your email. If you have a Gmail account, Google can look at it. It's in their user agreement. So what they do is they compile all this information and then they sell it to people. They'll sell it to advertising companies. They'll sell it to Facebook and Facebook puts it in their algorithm. And then that generates more stuff that shows up in your inbox. So you're the product of all these services that are free. So it's important to keep in mind that if you're not paying for a service, then you're the product. You're the profit maker for them and your actions are the profit maker. So any actions that you have can influence that and it builds your digital profile. So all the information that you put out there online is a fingerprint for you. It says who, what advertising you respond to, what product you're interested in, what TV shows you watch, what social networks you, you're on. All that information is valuable to someone and someone's going to make money off of it. And that money they make pays for you to have a Gmail account for free. So it's very important to kind of have, this is, I've talked to other people about this in the past, and it's kind of mind-blowing to some people when they hear these types of things because 
it's so innocuous, it's so transparent to the average user that you don't realize it. Like somebody's literally making money off of you. Like th that kind of offends me a little bit. Like people should only make money off of me when I choose to give it to them. And all these internet companies are brilliant enough to figure out how to, how to do it otherwise. So you're a product. Anyone who uses the internet is a product that's being sold to some degree on the internet. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. So when they hear that, they sort of start looking at things differently. And that's really what we need to look at. That's, that's the, the revolution in thinking we have to have when we talk about our digital fingerprint. So the good news is, even all that doom and gloom I just gave you there, the good news is there are things you can do to protect your digital footprint. When we come back, we'll talk about what we can and can't do to protect our digital footprint. And then you kind of have to make your decision of whether or not you want to use these services and give them your information and go from there. I used to be on Facebook. I still have an account on Facebook. I never log into Facebook. Never. They don't have, they don't have a clue what I do. I don't use Facebook login. I don't use any of the services they have because it's all them tracking me. Of course, that doesn't stop mommy from sending me 20 million links on Facebook automatically because they're trying to lure you back into the fold. And it's not mm. mommy's fault. It's just that's what they do. It's, it's almost like a drug dealer trying to get you hooked again. Mm. So you just have to learn what, the, what you can avoid and, and how to protect yourself. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about teens and your digital and their digital footprint. So now we're going to talk about what teens can do to protect their digital footprint. And this comes to us from webwatcher.com. Obviously, your teen is going to have some type of digital footprint. They can't avoid the internet entirely, and they probably wouldn't want to even if they could. But they can minimize their chances of creating a digital footprint that can cause problems for them later. For starters, make sure that your teen knows about privacy settings and why it's important to look for them on all the social media and websites they use. Not all websites make their privacy settings obvious, and some sites, like Facebook, are rather notorious for changing privacy settings without notifying users. So it's important to check them regularly after setting them to make sure that nothing has changed. But most websites do have privacy settings that can be adjusted to make your teen's sessions less public. Yes, your teen should never assume that anything is entirely private, but strong privacy settings still provide a better measure of protection than weak or no privacy settings. Sounds like we're really bashing uh, uh, Facebook today here. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not a big Facebook fan, you can tell from the show notes today. I mean, yeah. Uh, but really, Facebook's one of the biggest culprits here. Facebook has a proven history of misusing your information uh, as well as changing their – you go in and change your privacy settings. Next week, they could change their policy and reset your privacy settings. Mm. And you don't know it because they don't tell you about it unless you go in and look and police it yourself, which is really inappropriate. Yeah. It's also important to talk to your teen about making responsible choices 
and being good digital citizens. They should avoid oversharing, as, as you should in any crowd of people that you don't know. I mean, some of the stuff is common sense. If they're going to share secrets, it's usually better to do that offline than online. They should keep personal details private as much as possible. Addresses, phone numbers, and what school they attend are all examples of information they shouldn't share publicly. Would you grab a, a stranger on the street and say, hey, my phone number is blah, blah, blah? No. So why would you post it on the internet? Yeah, that that's honestly a really good example just to throw at people because, like, really, would you do that if, it, like, basically, you post something on the internet, a bunch of strangers are going to see it. So if you don't feel comfortable going to a stranger and just screaming it at them, why are you posting it on the internet? Exactly. There's billions of people on the internet. You'd be safer doing that on the street because there's fewer people you'd, you'd propagate that information to. Yeah. So you kind of have to put that scenario in mind when you're doing stuff. Uh, you should avoid posting photos and videos online that wouldn't be com you wouldn't be comfortable with a college admission office, your boss, or your grandparents seeing. And, and I love that. I think that's probably the best example. Don't do something or say something that you wouldn't be comfortable doing or saying to your grandparents. I think that's a good measure there because I think grandparents have a pretty good grounded reality of what is and isn't appropriate. Yeah. Um, you never know where the images are going to end up. Uh, they should make good choices about how they talk to and interact with others online. And this is, this is also very important because social media today, and I'm not going to point fingers at any particular group, political or religious or whatever, but social media today really is a cesspool. Mm -hmm. It's really, it brings out the absolute worst in human nature. There are so many attacks, so much nastiness, so much negativity. It's just, just it's literally the, the depths of human depravity on social media today. Yeah. So you have to be careful how, how much you allow that to muddy you when you get into it. So threats, angry messages, name calling, and so on can be interpreted as cyberbullying. Even if your teen's responding to similar messages or has been otherwise provoked, the words can be taken out of context. And the problem is it's like quicksand. You know, especially the the short, quick fire back of like Twitter. You know, you get on Twitter and you very quickly can fall into the quagmire of this negativity and attacks and hatefulness and it's like the news you know you how often do you turn on the news and you get good news you, know, it, you don't it almost never happens because it doesn't sell yeah and social media thrives on that negativity to the point that the algorithms of youtube and facebook they're geared towards it they're geared to tr towards Poking a stick in your cage to get a reaction because the more reaction they can get out of you, the longer you're going to stay on the site, which means the more ads you're going to see, the more times you're going to click on things, and that's that's how they make their money. So if you log in and you see three articles that are that are happy and nice and you know puppy dogs cuddling with you and stuff like that, you're not going to stay online that long. But if they flash something in front of your face that offends you or makes you mad or, or, you know, attacks you, you're more likely, it's human nature, that you're going to get more engaged in that. And Facebook thrives on that. And that's what makes it so terrible. And then it just builds like a, like a virus, really. It spreads quickly. Their algorithm adjusts itself because their algorithm is almost always key to what gets more clicks. So if the negative ads and the negative articles get more clicks, they're going to be thrown up in your face more often. And it's, it's just, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you're caught up in it because they've provoked you at this point. And four or five posts later, you're just as bad as the first guy who posted something. And that's what people see when they look at your digital footprint. So you have to be very careful about how you present yourself. 
sharing inappropriate jokes or memes, especially if they are making fun of or causing harm to others, like racist or sexist material, can come back to haunt your teen. Even if they didn't mean it or didn't expect to be taken seriously, it will be taken seriously and can do serious damage. It's important to teach your teen to avoid these kinds of actions online because it's the right thing to do, but also for their own sake. So that's some good stuff that you can do to protect yourself, but there are some things just by the very nature of the internet that you can't do to protect your digital footprint. So teens also need to be aware of what is out of their control. For instance, every device on the internet has a traceable semi-unique identifier called an IP address or an internet protocol address. IP addresses are linked to specific devices and logged every time you visit a website. Your teen can't change their IP address or erase the history of their device visiting a particular site, at least not without a VPN, which if you're not familiar with it, VPNs are virtual private networks and they're online services that encrypt your connection. So you would connect to the internet, you would connect to your VPN provider, and then your device, wherever you go on the internet at that, at that point, goes from your device through your network out to the VPN provider, encrypt it so nobody can see it, and then you emerge on the internet someplace else from that virtual private network's service. This allows you to anonymously connect to websites and other online services using an IP address of the VPN provider, which allows you to be anonymous, assuming the, v, uh, the VPN provider doesn't log your activity. So there's certain things to look for in VPN providers there. So is this a problem? Probably not for most teens. School and university officials and employers may take a look at a teen's social media profiles or use a search engine to see what pops up when they Google when they Google a teen's name. But if they're not but they're not going to track to try to track a teen's IP address. However, law enforcement has the means to track an IP address and will do so if they suspect a device or the owner of a device has been involved in something illegal. So that's important to keep in mind. And hackers may be able to obtain an IP address and use it to trace a device's activity or identify the person linked to that device, which could lead to anything from the release of embarrassing information to actual threats to physical safety. So one other thing to keep in mind is there are more secure devices and more secure services out there than others. And the one I'm going to throw out there, and I know my loving wife is going to growl at me for this, but I have to throw out Apple. Apple is a company that has a proven history of being interested in protecting your privacy. And the reason for that is they don't make any money off of you. And why don't they make any money off of you? Because all their products are ridiculously overpriced. So they make their money off of the services that you buy because they don't give anything away for free. Apple doesn't do anything for free. If you want to use something from Apple, a device or a service or whatever, you pay for it. That's how they make their money. And that's a good measure of how secure something is. If you have to pay for it, then what you're getting in return is the product. If you don't have to pay for it, you're the product. And when you don't have to pay for something, you have to think something is up. Because the old adage that nothing is free is more true on the internet than it ever has been. One good example is IP addresses. So Apple phones, modern operating, modern Apple OSs on their phones have a feature where they automatically mask your IP address for you. So you don't need a VPN. So every time you connect to the internet, you switch cell towers or you switch to your Wi-Fi or whatever, they give you a different IP address, which makes it very difficult. The other thing is apps that you install on your devices are tracking you. People don't realize that. The latest version of Apple OS, iOS for their devices, now tells you when an app decides that they want your information and you have a choice whether or not to give it or not. 
And it's the only operating system in the world that does that right now. Which should tell you right there about how much they value privacy. So if you're interested in digital privacy and controlling your digital footprint, do a little bit of research. Email us. I'll be happy to give you suggestions. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have on digital privacy. It's something that's a, a kind of a, a hobby or pet peeve of mine, but I also work in digital technology. So it's something that I'm immersed in pretty deeply. So feel free to reach out to us and email us at comments at insights into things.com. If you have any questions, I know I'm preaching a lot here and I don't want to go into a lot of technical detail and, and bore people any more than I already have. So if you have questions, reach out. I'll be happy to answer them. For once, you're actually a subject matter expert. There, for once. Thanks. I appreciate that. 133 <laughs> episodes in, I'm finally a subject matter expert. I mean, you are sometimes a subject matter <laughs> expert in certain things, but this is definitely something that, you know, you are pretty much a Thank subject Thank you, matter sweetheart. I, I appreciate that, appreciate that semi-vote of confidence. <laughs> so while these things are out of your teen's control, your teen can minimize uh, many of the risks to themselves by being careful about where they go what they do online, as well as by utilizing privacy settings, password protecting devices, and generally using good judgment. You can help your teen, uh, help keep your teen safe online by using monitoring tools to ensure that you're aware of any potential problems before they get out of control. So there is a ton of tools out there that we can use directly on our devices, through our web browsers, through the sites that we use, the social media services that we choose to use. There's a lot that we can do to control our digital footprint. You're not going to make it go away. Be careful what you put out there. And again, if it's not something that you'd be comfortable with your grandparents saying, or if it's not something that you'd be comfortable grabbing a random stranger on the street and telling them, then it's probably something that you shouldn't be putting on the internet because it's just as open and exposed. That's all we had here. We'll take a quick break and come back, get your th closing thoughts, and uh, go from there. We'll be right back. Go for your closing remarks. Alrighty, so I just wanted to say to everyone out there, your digital footprint can really matter in a lot of really big scenarios, whether it be scholarships, getting into college, going into the military, your employment, or even just being getting your identity stolen. Honestly, it really you can really do a lot of damage by just a simple post that can be offensive. So it's very important to keep track of what you do and to get the thoughts out of your head that um, you have, you are more, pr you have more privacy than you actually do, and that you, and that when you delete something, it's gone forever. You, basically, both of those are untrue. I'll you always need to make sure you have as much privacy as you can, but that you don't, but you need to know you don't have complete privacy, and that what you post online pretty much stays there. And basically, what Daddy said. Basically, if you're not comfortable sharing it with your grandparents or grabbing a random stranger on the street and telling them, then you probably shouldn't be posting it. Sage advice as always. Thank you. Before we go, I want to once again uh, encourage you to subscribe to the audio version of our podcast at Insights into Teen. Uh, it should be uh, listed as Insights into Teens. Our uh, video version is listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, also, feel free to reach out to us if you do have questions. Please let me know. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. You can email us at comments and insights into things .com. You can hit us on Twitter at twittercom slash insights into things. And I'm, it's funny because I just preached against all these social media sites, and now I'm going to list our <laughs> listings on there. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, it's not hypocritical. We, ha in order to get our stuff out there, this is really the only way that we can with a zero dollar marketing budget. Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to list Facebook this time, but Instagram. We're at Instagram.com/slash insights into things. 
Uh, I did promise uh, before the break that we would have a Discord server up. Technically, it is up. <laughs> it's just not ready yet. So mm. I was working on it today. Ironically, I'm not ready to release it to the listening viewership at this uh, listening audience at this point in time because I haven't had a chance to lock it down at this point and try to make it as secure as possible. So hmm. once I do that and get that all straightened out, I hope to have it up by our, our next podcast. But anyway, you can get links to all those uh, contacts on our official website at www dot insights into things dot com and you and don't forget to check out our other two podcasts insights into entertainment hosted by you and mommy and insights into tomorrow our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother sam and that's it another one in the books bye everyone bye <laughs>